Good evening, everyone, and welcome again to the 15th Annual Theodore Roosevelt Symposium at Dickinson State University. I am happy to introduce my colleague in the Theodore Roosevelt Center, Clay Jenkinson. He is an eminent scholar of both Thomas Jefferson and Theodore Roosevelt, um, two of our uh, most amazing presidents. And uh, he is the Theodore Roosevelt Humanities Scholar here at Dickinson State University, and he is the moderator of this symposium. So Clay, take it away. Uh, thank you, Sharon, and good evening, everyone. I see that uh, uh, President Stephen Easton is on one of these panels. Wave your hands, President Easton. Uh, he was with us briefly last night. We're glad you could join us. He'll be with us tomorrow out here in the Badlands. I'm in Medora, North Dakota tonight. Sharon and Kelly um, and I were out in the Badlands today checking out the connectivity for the live streaming tomorrow on our virtual tour of the Badlands. We're very, very excited about this. We've managed to make this I think Saturday morning a special one because we're going to be able to take you to places that we couldn't get to in a single day. We've been to the Southern Badlands, we've been to the Central Badlands, we've been to the Elkhorn Ranch today, we were at the Maltese Cross. We've been to not all of the Roosevelt sites in Western North Dakota, but a large number of them and we have some pre-recorded video and then we'll be doing live streaming and we hope you'll be with us, but I know that President Easton is going to be with us tomorrow and, and I'm looking forward to, to interviewing him about his own fascination with Theodore Roosevelt and the, and the world of Dickinson State University tomorrow. So uh, watch for that and we'll see you in the morning on that. Before we go any farther, I want to just say what you probably all know, uh, that Ruth Bader Ginsburg died today at the age of 87. And whatever your politics, She's been a major force on the United States Supreme Court. Uh, and so I just thought we would take 15 seconds here of silence just to pay tribute to this distinguished jurist. So thank you for that. Um, I was a Jefferson scholar before I became a, a Roosevelt scholar and I can tell you, um, buckle your seat belts, we're in for a wild ride uh, in the next few months in the United States and uh, we're going to see um, a political and constitutional crisis um, of the sort I think we have not seen in my lifetime, uh, but we all grieve um, the death of a, of, a, of a great figure in the history of the court. I'm going to introduce Deborah Davis here, and I'm so excited to do so, you know, and, and when we decided on this symposium, well, we immediately thought of you and wanted to bring you here. I'm sorry you're not with us in the Badlands, but I know you'll come another time. Uh, your resume is fascinating to me. I'm just going to go over a few of you. You've written 10 books. Here are a couple of them, Strapless. John Singer Sargent and the Fall of Madame X, that was 2003. Party of the Century, the fabulous story of Truman Capote and his black and white ball, that was 2006. The Oprah Winfrey Show, Reflections on an American Legacy, the authorized history of 25 years of the landmark television show and its legendary host, that was 2011. In 2012, the book that we're um, most interested in tonight, Guest of Honor, Booker T. Washington, Theodore Roosevelt, and the White House Dinner That Shocked a Nation. Um, 2015, The Trip, uh, the story of Andrew, uh, Andy Warhol's adventures in a cross-country road trip in America, plus more and more coming. Uh, I guess the question I want to ask before we really get started here is, how did you get this gig? This is the greatest thing in the world. You write about these slices, these moments in history. How did this all, tell us how this all came about. <laughs> it's, it's a good question, Clay. Um, my first book was Strapless and it began because I borrowed a gown to wear to the Academy Awards. And I kept saying, what painting does this remind me of? And it reminded me of the John Singer Sargent painting, Madame X. And I realized that nobody had written the story of that painting, and so I did. And that began my fascination with um, people who are larger than life and really good stories, wherever they come from. And I think that both of those characteristics definitely apply to Theodore Roosevelt, um, who I absolutely fell in love with when I was writing this book. And um, 
that's one of the reasons why I'm just so happy to be here tonight and have this opportunity to speak about him. And I think we're speaking to you in, in Montclair, New Jersey tonight. Yeah. I'm in Medora, North Dakota. This is, uh, this is the new Zoom world, and we're thrilled that you can join us. So you have all these possibilities of these moments, and, and, and your, um, your uh, list of books is all over the map. It's not as if it's the theme of the American Revolution or the time of the Civil War. How did you choose to write about this story? How did it come to you? It came in a flash. I was listening to John McCain give his concession speech on election night, and he said, we've come a long way since the scandal when um, Theodore Roosevelt entertained Booker T. Washington at the White House. And I thought, scandal? What scandal? I've never heard this story. And so I started to look into it, and I think what was most fascinating was not just that this dinner took place, but the incredible parallels between Theodore Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington, who in another time could have just switched places. And it was also a really vibrant moment in history. Um, the electricity was, was invented and the Kodak camera and ragtime music and all of these fascinating developments. Um, so the canvas, the larger canvas for the story was irresistible. And it was truly a wonderful time in, in history at, dominated by these two incredible men. Now, just before I, I, I turn it to you and then Anthony, if you would just put the two of us or, or the speaker's view on this, um, how long how long did it take you to write this book? Um, I'm never given much time. When a publisher gets excited, they want it yesterday. So this book, uh, I had about a year and a half to write. And so you won the prestigious Phyllis Wheatley Award. Phyllis Wheatley, for those who don't know, was an African-American poet at the time of the revolution. In fact, George Washington was so um, impressed by her that she had uh, his her poetry um, read to the troops. Amazing woman, an amazing award. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So I take it away. I know you have some You really got the award, you know, that night. Um, when, when, you, when you're a spokesperson for, for people of this stature, you know, you're just a spokesperson. You're being very gracious, but you deserved it. So take it away. Tell, lay the groundwork on this great moment when Theodore Roosevelt, just entering the presidency, invited this extraordinary civil rights leader, um, Booker T. Washington, to dinner. It was a, a, a very great moment. Um, it's September 14th, 1901, and a shocked and saddened Theodore Roosevelt took the oath of office after the sudden death of William McKinley and delegated most of the pressing matters to his secretary, William Loeb. But there was one letter that he dashed off himself. It was to Booker T. Washington, the founder and head of the Tuskegee Institute, and the man who was called America's Negro Moses. PR wrote, my dear Mr. Washington, when are you coming north? I must see you as soon as possible. What led them to this moment, the new president who was born a New York aristocrat and the great educator who was born a slave? They came from different worlds, but there were some remarkable parallels between them. Could I have the first two slides, please? So this is an illustration from Booker T. Washington's book, Up From Slavery, that shows his childhood. He was born in Halesford, Virginia, on a plantation and lived the typical life of, of a slave. And the next slide, uh, here's young T.R., a gentleman uh, in his little, what looks like velvet suit. Um, so there's quite a contrast between the two of them, although there were certain connections. As children, both worshiped Abraham Lincoln and aspired to be just like him. You may recall that the young T.R. actually watched Lincoln's funeral procession from his grandfather's uh, window in New York City. And while the boys were growing up, they were both inspired by popular motivational novels of the time. 
Horatio Alger stories that encourage them to paddle your own canoe, strive and succeed, sink or swim. They were ambitious, but they faced obstacles. Booker T had to teach himself how to read and struggled for an education. And Theodore Roosevelt, as we know, had some physical challenges, including terrible eyesight. And if I could have the next two slides. Here they are as young men. There's Booker T. Washington, and here's Theodore Roosevelt, and they look kind of the same. I mean, it's the same moment, same period. Um, both went to college. Um, and then they set out into the great world to make names for themselves. They both fell in love, got married, and lost their young wives to illness at approximately the same time. They both found themselves widowed with infant daughters who they knew nothing about or what to do with and experienced deep depression until they remarried and started new families. Then they both skyrocketed to success. TR entered politics at various times, serving as police commissioner in New York, assistant secretary of the Navy, and governor of New York, the country's vice president, and now the president. Booker T dedicated himself to building Tuskegee and developing an international reputation as the leader of and spokesperson for his people. He was considered the most powerful black man in the country, strategically using his carefully cultivated network of connections, PR machine, and funds to improve the lives of African Americans. And this is when I wanted to show you how similar their two family portraits are. This is Booker T. Washington and his family. And hopefully the next slide is Theodore Roosevelt and his family, remarkably alike. And I don't have pictures, but their homes, Sagamore Hill and the Oaks, were mirror images. When I, I visited both places when I was doing my research, I was struck that either family would have been completely at home in either house. They were virtually identical. But there was one big difference between the two leaders. Unlike TR, who was famously outspoken and impulsive, Booker T was highly strategic and conciliatory. Some people said his ability to work with the establishment was accommodationist. But that word has such negative connotations. And I've discovered there's a more understanding term that's used today, code switching, meaning that he was knowingly altering his behavior to survive in a white world. Booker T often said, if your head is in the lion's mouth, use your hand to pet him. When TR started meeting with Booker T, it was for two reasons, to talk about finding reasonable candidates for federal appointments, judgeships and the like, and TR wanted to appoint the best man for the job, whether it, he was a white, black, Republican or Democrat. TR also wanted to brainstorm about cultivating the black vote in the next election. And I think it's important to note that TR really valued excellence. When he saw someone who was accomplished, he did not see color. And that's what drew him to Booker T. Washington. He saw a remarkable man who had achieved so much and had so much to offer. He was also consulting with another remarkable African-American at the time, a man named William Henry Lewis, who had a very storied history. The son of former slaves, Lewis excelled as a student and as an athlete, and ultimately became a crusader for social justice. He studied law at Harvard, where he was the acting cap captain of the football team, the first black player to be voted All-American twice, the author of the first and definitive football manual, 
a primer of college football, and the genius behind Harvard's defeat of the University of Pennsylvania and Yale in 1898, when he led his team to victory by designing plays modeled after Napoleonic military maneuvers. TR, a fellow Harvard man, was one of his biggest fans and gave him a standing ovation at a celebratory dinner that year. Post-Harvard, TR appointed Lewis U.S. Attorney for Boston and a few years later, Assistant Attorney General in charge of immigration and naturalization for the New England states. But at the moment, TR considered Lewis his friend and relied on the young lawyer as he attempted to understand and navigate the very complicated racial landscape in America. So, on October 16th, 1901, TR decided to turn one of his late night meetings with Booker T into a dinner. As he was dictating the invitation, he hesitated, fully aware that it might be risky to invite a black man to dine at the White House. It had never been done before. No black man, woman, or child sat at the president's table. No matter how many people tell you that Frederick Douglass did or Sojourner Truth, no, it had never happened before. Recognizing that it was the right thing to do, TR sent the invitation before he could change his mind. Conversely, Booker T. Washington faced the same kind of dilemma when he received the invitation. He calculated the cost of an acceptance. It was safer to decline social interaction with whites in the South, and the White House was definitely in the South. But Booker T. knew that accepting was the right thing to do. So he did. The dinner that night was unremarkable. A quiet meal in the family's private dining room. A few of the children were in attendance. A friend of the, the Roosevelt's was there. And the meeting, the dinner was followed by a meeting to discuss candidates for judicial appointments. TR went to bed. Booker T took a train to New York. And all hell broke loose when the news got out. This is what the Atlanta Constitution had to say. Both politically and socially, President Roosevelt attends to, intends to coddle descendants of Ham. Action of president is roundly censored. Roosevelt has ruined the best Negro in America. I think that TR and Booker T hoped that the scandal would die down. That was really wishful thinking. Instead, it got worse every day. Southern newspapers pulled out an arsenal of racial slurs and fired them directly at the White House. From the Memphis Scimitar, the most damnable outrage which has ever been perpetuated by any citizen of the United States was committed yesterday by the president when he invited an N-word to dine with him at the White House. He has not inflamed the anger of the Southern people. He has excited their disgust. The Geneva Reaper in Booker's home state of Alabama wrote, poor Roosevelt, he might now just as well sleep with Booker Washington for the scent of that coon will follow him to the grave as far as the South is concerned. I can tell you, when I was doing my research, the headlines were eye-searing and relentless. And it was even more of a problem for me when I was publicizing the book and had to go on radio shows because I couldn't say anything. The words that came so easily to these newspapers and were a part of every headline were unspeakable. Clearly, the dinner wasn't just a dinner. It was a Pandora's box of the ugliest form of racism that once opened was impossible to close. And could we see 
a few of the slides, if you can just move forward. Here we are. Here's one. Here's another. And the next one, yes, it has come to this, was such a great political tool used against TR. And, and the distinguishing characteristic of this cartoon, this is something that never happened before. It depicted Mrs. Roosevelt. The wives of presidents and political candidates were considered a safe zone. They were never lampooned in cartoons, but clearly the cartoonist made an exception in this case and showed her at the table. And the next one, please. This is de Roosterfeld book. It's an entire book dedicated to the dinner at the White House with the most revolting poetry in it, which I wouldn't be able to repeat to you anyway, so I'll let you use your imagination. Um, but th this is what was spawned by this dinner. Uh, someone even tried to make a movie on the steps of the Capitol, uh, but luckily a, a, a policeman recognized that they were lampooning um, President Roosevelt and Booker T. Washington, the star was in blackface, and the film was seized and destroyed. Democrats decided that the dinner was their best weapon against Republican wins in local elections and TR's re-election in 1904. In South Carolina, Senator Ben Tillman, whose nickname Pitchfork Ben should have been a dead giveaway, told his party to use the dinner for all it's worth while the story is still fresh in the public's mind. Southerners were newly enraged by Booker T's latest recommendation for the job of collector of customs in Charleston, South Carolina. When TR tried to appoint Dr. William Crum, a black physician who was a native of the city and a staunch member of the Republican party, white Democrats went wild. For the next three years, TR submitted Crum's name to the Senate and Southern politicians saw to it that the appointment was stalled. TR kept appointing him on an interim basis, but pending confirmation, poor Dr. Crum was not allowed to collect a salary. So he had to see patients on his day off to support himself. Between the White House dinner and the Crum situation, TR was so loathed in the South that people hissed at his photograph. Officials in South Carolina warned the president not to come to their state because they couldn't guarantee his safety. TR continued to be confounded by the problem of race. In 1906, he became part of the problem. The place, Brownsville, Texas, where an unseen assailant shot and killed a white bartender and a policeman. The community blamed African-American soldiers who were stationed at Fort Brown, even though officers insisted that the men were locked in their barracks at the time of the shooting. The black soldiers were ordered to name the wrongdoers in their company, but they refused, insisting they were innocent. When TR heard the story, he jumped to conclusions and threatened all 167 men with dishonorable discharge. Booker T pleaded with TR not to be so rash, hoping he could be a steadying influence before TR alienated his black constituents. But TR was hot-headed and wouldn't listen. As threatened, he impulsively issued an order to dismiss the soldiers. He didn't know it at the time, but he was on the wrong side of history. In 1970, an official investigation proved that the Brownsville soldiers were innocent. Southerners were pleased with TR's decision, but they still blamed him for the insolent behavior of the black soldiers, saying it was because of the luncheon given to Booker T. Washington by the president at the White House. On the other side, 
TR's African-American supporters were furious. They felt betrayed and said that the president eat, might eat with a thousand Booker T. Washingtons and it would not hurt us as much as this action. The black community in New York swore they would seek revenge at the ballot box. TR was astounded. That dinner, again, wherever he turned, there it was, causing trouble. It became expedient to call the dinner lunch, as if that were a less offensive crime. And eventually, people forgot about the groundbreaking meal. But that dinner at the White House was the precursor of the confrontations at lunch counters that followed in the battle for civil rights. Because freedom is often defined by where a person can eat. That started with Theodore Roosevelt, Booker T. Washington, and the dinner that shocked a nation. So Clay, let me ask you, when was the first time you heard about this dinner? Oh, years ago, I've been writing a biography of Roosevelt, um, probably uh, Edmund Morris. And I read the account and, uh, and here's what I thought. And I have lots of questions for you. And I know that, that our, our folks do too. And by the way, just chat in your questions. Uh, Kelly uh, of our staff will gather them and pass them on to me. We want to get in as many questions from our virtual audience as possible. One of the things I regret is that we're not at live and in person because it's so much fun to watch the hands go up after a talk like this, Deborah. So when I first read about it, here's what I thought because of my background with Jefferson. The White House was built in 1800, well, begun. And Roosevelt's the 26th president of the United States. No African-American had been invited to dine at table, but African-Americans built the White House. They served as the cleaning staff and the janitors and the kitchen staff and the table servers for decades. So a lot of African-Americans had been in the White House and had eaten scraps in the White House down in the kitchen and so on. Um, Jefferson's uh, friend Sally Hemings appears to have given birth to one of her children, possibly in the White House. So there's a very long history of African Americans in the White House. And yet it wasn't until the 26th president of the United States that an African American was invited to dine at table the hypocrisy, the just the, the just the whopping injustice, hypocrisy, and 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 racism of that is astounding to think about, because these white presidents were perfectly happy to have African Americans doing the the work in the White House and building the thing, um, but it was socially appalling to invite an African American to dine. So that I can't, I still can't really understand that. I I understand it conceptually, but I'm sure you feel the same way. You, you, when you first read this, you're shocked mostly by the fact that it's 1901, aren't you? Yes, and, and um, I, I was very amused by, you know, the French response to, um, to this controversy that, that took over the whole country and, and then went international. The French said, we're surprised it never happened before. I mean, that's what shocked them. And, and it, it is shocking, um, but there were a few things at play and, and some of them I hadn't considered until I actually you know, delved into the, the subject. Um, one was that you know, politicians didn't entertain at table. Um, business was not mixed with social life. And in the South, there was a very good reason for that, or they thought it was a good reason. You would never invite someone to sit at your table unless you believed that they might marry your daughter. Um, that's just the way it was. So by inviting Booker T. Washington to sit at his table, and, and, and the, TR was saying, you are my social equal, and as my social equal, you are free to marry my daughter, which a lot of newspapers pointed out uh, that that would be the next event at the White House. Um, so it was, it, there were so many levels of, of why this was considered wrong 
that that mystified me then, mystify me today, and mystified a lot of people. And just on that, um, a Richmond, Virginia newspaper said, apropos of this, I suppose if the president dines an N, that he thinks that it's all right for black people and white people to mingle indiscriminately. And I suppose he thinks that black men should date our white women. And so they went right from this dinner to the sort of nightmare scenario of miscegenation and black men preying on young white women. Yeah, it went from it went from the dinner table to the you know to the the marriage bed. I mean, it was just it was you know and didn't stop. Um, but then, of course, the other thing that was crazy was the whole notion of of you know being publicly appalled by the thought of miscegenation when just about everybody who was African-American, including Booker T. Washington, had a white ancestor. Um, so, you know, it, it, it may not have been happening legally or in public, but it was certainly something that was happening everywhere all the time. Of course. And, and uh, not by consent. So questions are starting to come in. I want to get to them. I want to ask just a couple quick more first about the incident itself. Roosevelt gave some mixed messaging about this over time. Um, he said, for example, that he never thought about it. He never paused. He just, it, it just, it seemed inevitable. Although, why wouldn't I invite him to supper? You're saying that there was this moment where he actually paused and wondered, what are the ramifications of this? Yes, he, he actually tells us that. He, he details the whole thing. And I believe it was in a letter. Uh, to, to someone because I quoted it um, where he says I, 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 I hesitated and then you know before I could essentially cave you know I, se I sent it out before I could change my mind but those are his words so he actually did understand what was happening I think that later um, when things started to go wrong he was more indignant about it you know what and and he actually said i i shall have him to dinner as often as i want although the invitation he never again away, right never again we never again invited an african american to dine with him so you know he he realized um, i mean and presidents sometimes do this something early in their administration turns out to be one of the flashpoint controversies this was within weeks of his uh, becoming president and this really upset me when you were talking um the paper that said this has ruined the best Negro in America. Parse that. Why did that ruin, in the mind of that bigoted editor, ruin the best African American in the country? Well, there was actually a term that, that started to get used at the time called Negro, Negro aspiration. And the fear was that um, this dinner would ignite Negro aspiration, that su suddenly... Um, they wouldn't know their place. And that Booker T was one of those um, African Americans, because he behaved well, uh, who seemed to know his place. But now that he had sat at the president's table, he might think that he was free to go anywhere. Although, interestingly, um, the year before, Booker T Washington had been invited to have tea with the Queen. At Buckingham Palace, and no, you know, in England, that was great. Uh, so it was only in America that it was such an issue, and and that's why uh, Southern Democrats kept coming back to it whenever there was an incident um, that that seemed to um, be about someone who was black overstepping their bounds. It was because of the dinner that this had broken some sort of a taboo and then all hell was going to break loose thereafter. So Ben exactly. Tillman, Pittsburgh Ben Tillman was one of the most vicious people in the history of the United States Senate. I can't quote him, but he said, and I'll get the paraphrase, he said, now we're going to have to lynch a thousand ends to put them back in their place. I mean, think of that. Now we're going to have to lynch a thousand black men in the South to undo the damage that TR had done by allowing this African-American to rise above that, that boundary. But he got his comeuppance. There was a, um, an incident in the Senate. He was involved in some kind of a brawl. So he was uninvited from the most important political dinner of the year and had to sit it out. Um, but he does sound like 
a vile human being. Here's a, a question from President Easton, the president of Dickinson State University. What was the reaction to the dinner in the North and in the Northern press? Well, I, I think you can kind of predict what the reaction was. Um, the press was very favorable, very supportive. And um, in the North then, Booker T became the most desired dinner guest. The poor man probably just didn't want to eat anymore. You know, he was, he, it, it became a kind of, um, you know, status symbol to have Booker T for dinner in the North, uh, if, if only to come out against what was happening in the South. So the, that's interesting because you might have expected that even in the North, there would be some edginess about this because the North was not exactly enlightened on questions of race, but you're saying it was a, he was heroized in the North and demonized. For the most part, there was a, an interesting exception, and that was um, Mark Twain. Um, Mark Twain, who was not a fan of, of TRs and, and who in fact had said that um, TR wasn't fit to untie Booker T. Washington's shoelaces. Um, <laughs> he had an issue with the dinner, but it was, it was um, more theoretical. He believed that the, the, any president did not have the right to treat his home, to treat the White House as his home. He was just a high class tenant and um, that he shouldn't be making political statements like that that didn't represent how the whole country felt. So there, there were people who felt that way, that, that um, the White House was, should not be the setting for a statement of that kind. There's a question from Patricia O'Toole, who gave that great keynote uh, lecture last night. Do you know why TR preferred Booker T. Washington to W.E.B. Du Bois? Yes. Um, they were not in the same place at that moment in time. Um, du Bois, Booker T. Washington was without question the leader of African Americans at the time. Du Bois had a valid voice, but he was not a leader. If, if you went into um, the home of a black person, you were likely to see uh, either a photograph or a rendering of Booker T. Washington. Uh, so he was more important at that moment. There was a shift happening and um, eventually Du Bois would become the more important voice, but it hadn't happened yet. Now, I know you rejected the term accommodationist and absolutist because they seem reductive um, and they're so charged with, um, with, uh, with moral and intellectual baggage, but we get the point The Booker T. Washington was famously uh, willing to work from gradually from within the system that he wanted not to um, overly upset uh, the white community. He wanted to accommodate white concerns and prejudices as much as he dared to do, whereas Du Bois was much less willing to do some of that. So yeah, I would imagine that white people wanted to privilege that sort of an African-American response of Booker T. Washington's and were more likely to freak out over the kind of more um, potent politics of Du Bois. But Booker T. Washington was also subversive and he, he had a public persona and he had a private persona. And privately, he funded lots of lobbyists and, and, and you know, had this incredible network um, to try and reverse Jim Crow laws. Um, but he, he was one of those figures who didn't want you to see him coming. You know, he was subtle and he, he was glad handling in public, but he had a whole other agenda in private. And, and there did come a moment, you know, there, there's a difference between someone who experienced slavery firsthand and who recognized what it would take to climb up from slavery and somebody like Du Bois who did not experience slavery and, and who had many of those second generation advantages that were not available to Booker T and, and to people like him. And Booker T was a valid bridge. Um, there came a moment when it was time for, um, for the Du Boises to take over. 
But for years, Booker T. Washington had to do all of the heavy lifting. And I think of the distinction between first tier, first generation feminists and second generation feminists and some of those social tensions. Here's one from Rod Sullivan. Um, Booker D. Washington tells of his first meeting with T.R. T.R. was an assemblyman in New York, the youngest ever. At the time, they met at the 42nd Street Ferry. T.R. carried one of Booker T. Washington's bags. Do you think this is a true story? No, it's not. It's Where's not it a true story. I can't tell you how much time I devoted to trying to find the first meeting. Um, and there were some, some tantalizing clues um, maybe at a club in New York, but they really, um, TR was a great fan of Up From Slavery. And um, they wrote to each other, it, TR wrote to Booker T. Washington and said that, that he and Mrs. Roosevelt were very you know, pleased with the book and um, found it so interesting. Um, it's more likely that they met for the first time when um, TR came back from Cuba and was in New York with the Rough Riders, uh, quarantining. And I, I, I think that that's probably the moment, um, but I was unable to, you know, I can't say exactly what it was because I was unable to prove it. All right, thank you for that. Cindy, one of our favorite people of South Dakota, has been at all of our events, glad to have you back. She has selected your book for our October Wine, Women, and Words book club meeting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what would be a good opening discussion question, do you think? What would be a good opening discussion? Well, I think what I find, you know, when, when I, I do speak about the book and to book clubs and places like that, people are just fascinated by the whole wave of Black achievers who came forward at this moment in time, whether it was Scott Joplin or um, Paul Dunbar, the poet. And I think it's a good question to say, you know, were, were you surprised that there was such a robust um, community of black intellectuals and, and um, you know, who really made a mark on the world? Um, and and it, it's something that we, a moment in history that often gets overlooked because there was so much that was terrible that came before it and there was so much that was terrible during and after. But this was like a, a golden moment, a renaissance. And um, I, I really found it fascinating and, and I, I've always found that other people have too. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, Mark asks, how did TR's inner circle of friends and advisors react to this dinner? We were talking last night about how poor Lodge and Elihu Root had to raise their eyebrows so often at TR's impulsiveness and so on. What do we know about his closest friends and his advisors? Well, you know, one of his, his, his friends had been at the dinner, a, a friend from Colorado, and they, because they had both been there, they wrote back and forth a lot saying, you know, oh my God, weren't you so shocked that people made such a fuss about this? And, you know, it was such an innocent meal. I, I don't recall um, what other, the people who you would say were the people in his circle thought. I'm sure there was a lot of eye rolling um, because it just created so many problems. And when TR came into the White House, one of the first things he said was that he planned to, you know, be a friend to the South. And, you know, he, he made that statement more than once, tried to, you know, keep things nice. And what's the first thing he does? He drops a bomb. So whatever, you know, work had been done in, in, in the, the weeks before, was essentially negated. And, uh, and, and I'm sure it was a huge headache to the point where his own administration tried to flip this into the story of a lunch. By the time they were done, it was TR, Booker T, a tray at the office, and, and maybe a sandwich. Um, you know, there was a lot of spinning and it, 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 the spinning happened on the Republican side to try to counter what was happening with the Democrats. 
Right. I think that's where the story came that, that they were having a meeting and he just said, why don't you stay for supper? And, and yeah, so are you the, hungry? Uh, you know, you want some coffee? Spin, con spin <laughs> control. Um, so, and we have to keep in mind that TR desperately wanted to be elected in his own right in 1904. And this made, this could have been a significant issue that he, in a sense, lost the South at that moment. Um, and and he never fully recovered that political base, although he kept saying in later life that his mother was a Southerner and he, you know, that he had Southern roots and so on. Here's a really great question from Helen May. Uh, do you know who was the second black person to dine at the White House? Oh my God, what a great question that I'm so embarrassed I can't answer. It's worth um, knowing though, isn't it? I don't know either, but I mean, of course we should know that. Was it FDR? Was it Eisenhower? I mean, how much longer then did it take? I can't imagine Woodrow Wilson. That, that is a fabulous question, and, 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 and I will get to it probably as soon as I get off this call. So then you can, you can let us know, and Sharon and I will disseminate it as the, but uh, Helen May deserves your, your praise for asking a really, really important question. Um, I'm just wondering if it was five years, 10 years? It's never happened again during TR's seven years. No, well, and it certainly wouldn't have happened with Wilson. Right, right. <laughs> um, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there, you know, entertainers came to the White House. Um, I, but I, not to dine, necessarily. Probably not to dine. And, and uh, you know, anybody who knew history was probably not eager to repeat the, um, the scandal of that first time. So we will learn the answer. Here's one from Liz Owens in Indiana. Does your research make any connection between this story and James E. Amos, TR's longtime bodyguard and valet? I mean, what do you mean by connection? Um, I think that, uh, you know, it, it, it shows that, you know, there were, there were people who were part of the larger Roosevelt um, family, even in, you know, household capacities, who were with them for a long time. Um, you know, I, I, I came across several stories, not about people who worked um, for the Roosevelts, but, you know, there, there was an instance when he was governor of New York, when um, an opera, no, was it an opera singer or a piano player, I'm, I'm having trouble remembering which, um, African American, came to perform at the governor's mansion and then left to go to his hotel and was turned away because he was black. And the Roosevelts did not hesitate in welcoming him right back to the house to, to spend the night. You know, uh, William Henry Lewis spent the night at, um, at, at Sagamore. You know, they, they, again, I think that if somebody was a person of accomplishment, there was no prejudice. Um, 167 black soldiers, something else at Brownsville. It's a strange dichotomy. And, 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 and more than once I'd say to myself, how could he say that? Or how could he do that? I mean, what he said about the, the black soldiers in, in Cuba, how could he say that? Um, sometimes he really astonished me. But I think that, you know, leaders are human. They have flaws. And you have to take both into account. We have a few more questions. And Sharon, you'll let me know when we need to wrap up. I know. Here's from Matt, our next speaker. What reaction, if any, did Washington experience once he returned to Alabama? Oh, my God. Death threats. Um, his life was, was in jeopardy constantly. Uh, an assassin, one, one assassin in particular, this was a funny story, um, was hired to go to Tuskegee to kill him. They hired a black assassin. He fell off the train just before he got to Tuskegee, injured himself, and discovered that he couldn't be taken to the white hospital. He had to go to the black hospital, which was on the grounds of Tuskegee. And everybody treated him so well that he was so ashamed that he just skulked off and never completed his mission. But apparently, death threats came in at a remarkable pace. Hmm. 
this is another great moment. Uh, Rick Marshall is our, um, our expert. He's the nation's leading expert on TR and cartoons. He's doing some really interesting work for the TR Center, giving the background to the history of political cartoons and particularly annotating and, and, um, and uh, providing great detail on uh, the cartoon archive that, uh, that, that he's collected and that we've been able to collect. And here's his question for you. I do cartoon archival work at DSU. The cartoons you shared are new to me. I have always been surprised how few cartoons there were at the time commenting, um, uh, of course, awful Southern ones, only a few commentary cartoons from the North. Did you find more cartoons than we've seen here? And if you don't mind, whoever is running that, can you go back to the PowerPoint and show us those cartoons again? But is that the sum total of the cartoons on this subject? No, or no I, I, I found more cartoons. And, you know, th this was the, the amazing gift of um, the internet. Um, because I was able to go to individual newspapers and, and you know, put in search words and, and things came up. And, and also I was in a lot of archives. Um, but um, yeah, there were, there were a lot of cartoons, um, none of them flattering. Uh, and, and I don't think any of them were supportive. I'd have to, I'd have to go through my file to... Um, well, let me anticipate uh, Rick Marshall's next comment. Can you help provide him the cartoons that you have discovered? Because that is an, a really important um, um, part of our attempt to be comprehensive in this way. So thank you for that. Uh, here's Rod Sullivan, uh, who says that some sources say that in 1929, Mrs. Hoover, Herbert Hoover's wife, invited an African-American Jesse de Priest to tea at the White House. So... Okay, well, maybe you've saved me some work. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll keep looking, but we appreciate that. So here's a question. Um, I have a question on what, uh, William Henry Lewis. I want to come back to that, but why did Roosevelt write that letter? I must see you. He's just in the presidency. The former president is dead. He's just arrived and is getting settled. He has to think about uh, trusts and conservation and America's foreign policy and Panama. And he has a wide range of concerns, um, union V, uh, I mean, labor V management in, the, in what will become the anthracite coal crisis. Why does he write an urgent letter to an African-American in a faraway state? I know you said about appointments and so on, but, but that's a very strong letter that TR wrote to you. What do you make of it? You know, I, I came across a funny anecdote about Lincoln. Um, somebody said to him, Mr. Lincoln, you look so down. What's wrong? Is it the Civil War? You know, is it, is, is it the war? And Lincoln said, no, it's that judgeship in Mudtown, wherever. You know, these federal appointments um, were very, very difficult because they were, there were so many and they were so small. But here's the thing about TR. As we know, he was completely against um, just, you know, doing that patronage system. He wanted to do something revolutionary. He really wanted to make it a signature of his presidency that um, finding the best man for the job, putting uh, a Democrat in a position, you know, if you were a gold Democrat, putting um, a black man in a white place, putting a white man in a black place. I, I think he thought he could really make a difference with that. And, and I think that he welcomed um, his previous conversations with, with Booker T. Washington must have been um, reassuring. And um, I think that he felt that it was, he was somebody who he could get real advice from, you know, with no agenda, uh, that he could trust him, and um, and he must have been very happy with with their meetings before. So that's my take on it. So um, again, I'm so appreciative of these questions. If you have more, please uh, send them in on chat. This is precisely the way we want these sessions to go. So Deborah, Clay, yeah, excuse me. Um, we're about at time to move to the book signing and um, give people a little break in between sessions. So if you have one more question and then we'll um, move over. I have, two, I have two, but they're brief. So William Henry Lewis, African-American athlete, uh, 
why was he so readily embraced? You know, as late as 1968, the University of Alabama almost refused to play in a bowl game because there were African-Americans on the other team. So why was he embraced? He was a fantastic player. And um, he, he played center, even though he was, a, you know, a little underweight for, for that kind of role. But he won the respect of his team at Harvard Law um, they just, they, they thought that he was brilliant and he was brilliant. I mean, who makes designs football plays, you know, from Napoleonic maneuvers. Uh, right. and, and I think that it was just about winning and he was the best man to take them to victory. Uh, so, and, and it was, you know, it was Harvard, it was all Ivy league. Um, we're talking about, you know, playing against Yale and, and, and um, University of Pennsylvania. But he was, he was an amazing specimen. And, and his book is really incredible. I mean, not that I know anything about football, but I, I read his football manual. And one of the things he says is that, um, you know, to be a good player, it doesn't take strength and it doesn't take speed. It takes character. And so I'm sure that, that he had quite an effect on his team members, and he certainly impressed TR. So let me just ask this last question very quickly, and you can only give a short answer. It's really unfair to ask okay. it. But in the face of the, of, the, of the Black Lives Matter movement and the decision by the American Museum of Natural History to remove the TR statue and so on, I think I hear one of the takeaways from your lecture that this is a very, very complicated issue, and it doesn't do us much good to be simplistic about TR and race. No, it doesn't. And, um, you know, that's why I wrote a whole book about one incident, um, this White House dinner, when clearly um, TR followed the impulse of his good angel and did the right thing. And, um, and, and so I think that we can celebrate all of his accomplishments and tisk or criticize him for where he went wrong. He's a man. He's a human. 